to another episode of Horror Movie Night. This week, we're watching Neon Maniacs, as picked by Scott, uh, which Brian messaged us in the group chat and just said, so that was sort of a movie. Uh, so, <laughs> and that's the best way I could describe it, too. Scott, what made you pick Neon Maniacs? Um, the cover? <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen it before, and I knew it came out in 86, and it had rubber suit monsters, and that's pretty much all I need to know to pick it for Horror Movie Night. Well, since this is an unfinished movie, uh, according to every website that I read, we need it to bring in some reinforcements to get through this one. So we are joined by Mike James of Five Second Films, who you know that we fucking love because we end the year just praising Dude Bro Party Massacre 3 this year. So, Mike, thank you so much for joining us and watching this piece of trash known as Neon Maniacs. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me. I uh, I watched it last night, and I have to be honest with you, I had a great time. I, <laughs> I actually, my girlfriend and I actually really liked it. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I made notes, and uh, I'm really ready to get into it. <laughs> All right, so the movie kicks off with this weird intro that sounds like a mix of Vincent Price's thriller speech and the intro to the Haunted Mansion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't say enough about the music in this film. <laughs> I loved the music from the opening uh, title credits. All, all the way the, to the smooth jazz outro. All the way to yeah. the jazz out, and then the music performance and the battle of the band. I mean, it just kept on hitting for me in the, the, the pedal of the fans was like watching a live action Emmett Otter where you just have like this one really clean cut band and then you had the Nightmare City rock band yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the highlight of the movie the last third of this movie where there's no rubber suit monsters is the best part of the film um you know so, why you like it because it's uh, it feels like watching better off dead it absolutely okay. feels it, like yeah better this off is dead. this is not even really a horror movie it's like a romantic <laughs> comedy i don't know it would be like if you if you tried downloading like a john hughes film the warriors and then like extra on LimeWire and something went wrong and they all just kind of downloaded together in one file. That's like what Neon Maniacs is. Well, like I have a note here where like the lead actress laughs way too much at dumb jokes for someone who saw all of her best friends yeah, slaughtered what the hell and is the killers on the loose. I feel yeah. like the movie has a really bad memory of like <laughs> yeah. just forgot that all of her friends were murdered in front of her. And then also the movie in general forgot to be a horror. Yeah. <laughs> At a certain point in time, it was like, oh, wait a minute. We're supposed to have like scary stuff happening. Sorry about that. So here's the fun thing about this movie they shot half of it, lost all of their funding for a year, <laughs> and then continued to film. But if you look at the closing credits of all the maniacs, most of them are played by two or three different people because when they shut down the first time, they couldn't get a lot of the original actors back and just had to throw oh. different people into the costumes. Uh, oh. So yeah, they did forget what they were making for about a year. That explains why the middle of it is just a rom-com because they yeah. were like, we can't pay for rubber suit monsters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the line that made me laugh probably more than it should have, but there's, there's an actress in this movie who plays the character of Paula who is way too cute for someone who's never been in another movie, but it's awkward because she's like 30 playing a 12-year-old throughout yeah, the entire movie. Yeah. <laughs> with, <laughs> with her, her hat kept moving. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time you see her, and I don't know why this made me laugh, but the mom's like, what are you doing awake? And she's like, I'm testing out the makeup. And I wrote, what makeup? You've got plastic fangs in a cape. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to love this movie. And I feel like... <laughs> It, it, there are some scenes that are just fantastic, but and Paula is the only person in this movie that realizes that she's in a horror movie. She's like <laughs> trying to make it Monster Squad and everybody else is trying to do better off dead. So uh, she's fun, though. Uh, as dumb as this movie is, her room is fucking tight. Like, oh, yeah. She's got like all sorts of uh, uh, like prosthetic heads and stuff. <laughs> I was like, man, that room is, I want that room. Me making a documentary, like, <laughs> that's the thing that I kept getting confused about. I was like, what's the, 
are you investigating something? I... <laughs> She's like Nancy Drew throughout this movie. Yeah, yeah but she, once again, she like forgets. <laughs> I really feel like I had a, a, an, a story arc. If only I could remember what it was. Hey, hey, well, hey. Wait a minute. This reminds me of another film that I really liked called Dubre Party Massacre 3. <laughs> it was like, but my investigation. <laughs> <laughs> but my investigation. You have no, like, you, you cannot know how often I make that, I reference that on the show and off the show in my real life. It's unfair to my wife and co-hosts. Yeah, Scott Scott quotes that movie, I think, the most out of the three of us, and it's it's great every time. I, Anytime uh, I make a mistake, Scott hits me with, do you think you're better than me because you have a tie <laughs> and a job? That, that is, that's probably one of the best improv lines. <laughs> I just really love tropes. I really love <laughs> stuff where it's just like ubiquitous, but you can't exactly put your finger on what movie that is. It's just a thing that's just like, I know that a million movies have done that exact same thing, and I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. You mean like the blowjob decapitation that I've seen yes. thousands of times, but never as lazy as this one? No, <laughs> God, I love the blowjob blow decapitation. Decapitation and dude, bro. Well, it's not quite a decapitation, but it's <laughs> you're going through a girl's head, <laughs> sea trunk's head, actually. <laughs> An opener. So yeah, exactly. Like I just think there's something really funny about super familiar tropes. <laughs> like I think Battle of the Bands in the third act is all. <laughs> You know what band the the metal band reminded me of? They sound exactly like um, uh, uh, sorcery from uh, Rocktober Blood, and they oh, I, like that's... I said beef. They remind me a little bit of like beef in the undeads. Well, in so Paradise I, too. I, 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 yeah, I, I didn't get beef. <laughs> I got um, uh, what are they called? Oh, I have a note. Um, uh, Shadow. From New Year's Evil, they look like Shadow that did the theme for New Year's Evil, but they sound yeah. like that song sounds like "I'm Back" by Sorcery in Rocktober Blood. Um, but they're described as some bad mothers. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> like, the guy who's the romantic male lead in this is such a yeah. goober. <laughs> what, yeah. what bothers me about this movie and Hard Rock Zombies, and they do this a lot. Even Rockula does this. Is I've been to Battle of the Bands. And if you're at a battle of the bands and it's just like a bunch of like metal bands competing and then Jars of Clay gets up to play their song, <laughs> they're not winning. They're not making it past the first round. <laughs> the other part from that that I really loved was the security guard in the basement. Because it's like, <laughs> what are you guarding? And like, why? <laughs> Like, what sense does that make? Like, I love it when there's a random security guard guarding nothing, just watching TV. It, like, makes so much more sense. It's like, this is just a squatter that has a TV <laughs> in the basement. I think it would be way funnier just to show it as is, as opposed to, and cut to a security guard guarding nothing. He's got to be the first to die. All right, trouble's coming. <laughs> so my favorite, like... It was like these four different things happened back to back to back. And it made me laugh so hard is Paula is doing her like little Nancy Drew investigation. And this cop grabs her and she gets scared and she runs and she's fucking running Sprint. so hey. long and so far. And the camera just lingers on her running. And I'm like, man, how many takes did they have to do of this poor girl running? But then it cuts to the cop riding her bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No sense. Why riding a bicycle? And then it takes and he's just like, "Well, what are you gonna do, kids?" And it's like, yeah. "Yeah, what a bit? What are you?" But, but then she makes a pig joke, but it's so monotone when she just rides off and goes oink 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 oink, and the cop does this weird like throws up his fist like he's about to fight and then immediately goes to like 80s sitcom opening credits where he just shakes his head like oh that kid yeah <laughs> yeah I, I don't i don't that that really i, I, I wanted to throw my shoe at the television I, <laughs> that was really confusing 
the quality of the costumes and stuff is so dramatically different every single shot too like yeah there's like the the neanderthal guy from like the wide mm-hmm. shots just looks like a dude in a loincloth like they didn't have any prosthetics on his face and then they well, cut to these close-ups and it's like a pretty decent mask I kind of wanted to talk about the assembly of, of mutants because it was really kind of like the village people of. Yeah. Of <laughs> yeah. And, they had I, I, teams, <laughs> there was policeman maniac, caveman maniac, <laughs> samurai maniac. I think samurai maniac was my favorite. There's <laughs> one. Do you remember the one specific shot where it's like two of the maniacs take off going and then the samurai guy is like, well, I'm not going that way. See ya. <laughs> I just <laughs> like, I like the progression of budget in the maniacs where it's like, you have this guy and it's like, oh, nice. This is like straight Hellraiser. And it's like, okay, let's do the samurai. Let's do like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers villain. Uh, all right, let's do uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from the 1920s. And let's just paint an Indian's face on it. All right, call it. <laughs> but the gooey hand looks all like there's oh. the one shot where there's like a gooey hand. It looks so good. Yeah, well, no, they, they, they that's the. Oh, there's so many questions that are never answered in this film. They could have got better makeup if they would have been smarter people to to defend these villains. Like, think about how much money because this wasn't a big fucking company budget. So those fucking water guns added up. They could have just gotten buckets of water. A, in the movie, it would have defeated the monsters much easier than a squirt gun. And B, you could have bought some makeup. Yeah. Simple um, solution. You know what's really blew my mind about this movie? This unfinished film. You know what the writer did after this movie, Scott? I don't know. I had no idea. He wrote Pumpkinhead. I love uh, Pumpkinhead. That sounds... Oh. I get it, though. Because <laughs> Pumpkinhead like, is kind of a mess, too. Yeah, right. but that's that's like James Gunn going from Ro- Romeo and Juliet to Slither. Like, it is a dramatic upgrade from this into Pumpkin. Let's Head. not. No, no, no. Like, that, <laughs> James Gunn, no. Like, I love James Gunn and I love Slither, but let's not put Pumpkinhead on Slither, like, <laughs> level because Pumpkinhead is great. But Pumpkinhead 2 is better. <laughs> Shut the <laughs> fuck up. Uh, so, Scott, I'm not sure if you wrote a note about this, but for once again, in almost every 80s horror movie we've watched, someone complains that they could be home watching Dynasty. Yes, I have that note. I, that's happened. Now, that's a trope. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's been like eight movies this past year where someone's like, I could be home watching Dynasty. <laughs> and they're serious. <laughs> i have so many notes and i haven't even touched them like <laughs> oh man so th- there's this they so the main male lead he's like running after his dog and then the dog goes up to the van full of all the kids that get killed except for the female lead and i don't i i didn't write anybody's names down i mean male lead and female lead are basically what they are oh like oh this. oh natalie is the female lead so she the dog comes up and and they call him pasta breath and i'm guessing he works at he works at an italian restaurant uh, no it's a deli yeah, it's like, man, really <laughs> Like it just, I don't know. I, I I don't really give a shit about anybody in this film, which is fine because most of them don't even last ten minutes. Um, but the, uh, the, I think that somebody does a defensive burp. <laughs> like I don't remember if he does it at the male lead or if he does it at um one of the maniacs. But I do have to give this movie props because this first scene when six kids get murdered by the maniacs for no reason is really fun. Dude, the leg (laughs) twist off. Yes. (laughs) It's, it's got some moments. It's definitely, that's like a a highlight for the movie for sure. So the, the maniacs and then the battle of the bands. (laughs) Yeah. Well, here's, here's a question. So the maniacs turn to green goo when they are exposed to enough water but they come back every time. Is that what I'm gathering is like yeah, even if the samurai, because like all of them are out in the park murdering kids and all that's left is the green goo at the, at, uh, at the end of that scene, because it starts to rain, but you see those characters, you see those maniacs again. So is it like, they're just spawn? Is it like we're watching magic, the gathering being played <laughs> and, and somebody's playing a black deck 
in under the Golden Gate Bridge and somebody's fighting them with the blue deck? Is that, I don't. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> it's so. Scott, again, this movie was never finished, so I feel like that was a lot of stuff that would have been answered. And, like, everything I read about it was, like, even the screenplay writer can't remember where the origins of these creatures were. He's like, it was in there. I don't remember what their origins are, but we had it. There was a lot of coke, (laughs) all right? Um, There's – we normally don't, like, point out continuity errors in in our movies. Because we're okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, but there's this chase scene on the train – where the order in which people are in the chase changes with every cut. Yeah. <laughs> I, was I was like, is like that stressed. intentional? <laughs> no, I, was, I was getting so stressed because I was like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Yeah, like the girl would be in the back and then it would cut and she's suddenly in front of everybody and then it would cut again and she was behind the guy. Like, I was like, this is nuts. Like, are they doing this on purpose just to be like, yeah, we'll fuck with them. I Why think not? My favorite part of the train scene is when it cuts to the maniac driving the train and he's <laughs> bouncing with delight. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The man is so happy. He's just like, I'm killing kids with such a stressful job. This is what I want to be. I want to be a conductor. <laughs> so, so I don't know if, because I had, I, I found a DVD, like someone gave me a box of DVDs and it was in that box that I watched. So I didn't watch the YouTube version. But the version that I had, the train sequence happens, some more stuff happens, and then it just cuts to the guy driving, the, the maniac driving the train for a couple seconds out of nowhere, and then continues the rest of the movie. Did yeah, that like happen the, on the YouTube version? There was, yeah, that was, yeah, that was the YouTube version. It was, <laughs> it was a weirdly amount of, like, first off, the, the conductor gets killed in kind of a cruel way. He gets, like, electrified. Yeah. Yes, because he was electric mutant, I guess. Yeah, electric, <laughs> electric maniac yeah, doesn't make any sense, mutant. though, because how could you be – but when electric maniac gets – um, he, when he gets murdered, when he gets killed yeah. by the water on the stairs in the high school, he right. gets electrified. He doesn't melt. So there's no internal consistency with these maniacs at all. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, guys, did you watch this on YouTube? Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I watched it on YouTube. I watched it on Prime, and I was so amazed that it was on Amazon Prime <laughs> for free. I didn't even look for it on Prime. I just looked for it on YouTube, but I posted it in our in our Trello. I was like, "Here, it's on YouTube." I didn't even like look. I didn't even look on Prime because I was like, "No way is this on Prime." So yeah. I just had a thought, guys, as we've been talking about this movie and it's Electric Maniac and it's Samurai it's Gremlins. Maniac. I, I know it's Gremlins too, the new Maniac. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to make that joke because I thought that it was good, not going to hit at all. <laughs> Well, I took that hit for you. And, and you it right. was a smart move. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I just want to mention one more thing about the battle bands because I have so many notes about it. The first song that they sing probably should suck more than it actually does. No, the, the first song's a good song. <laughs> <laughs> but the second song is trash except for the saxophone. Oh, <laughs> like, God. <laughs> I'll defend the music in this film to the death. I I really I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up on vinyl, <laughs> dude. If you the can we find had... this on vinyl, I will be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> the we had enough song, man. That song's the shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's gonna be stuck in my head all day. But then there's also so there the maniacs attack the battle of the bands. Everyone's got their water guns and they're they're cleaning house like it's the end of Bordello Blood. Yeah, and there's like this spot where it just kind of seems like they're implying a random sex scene happens. They like, do. Again. They bang in the, <laughs> the science lab. And I'm like, wait, what? Are, you're getting chased by maniacs. This is not a good yeah. time to fuck. Pretty the last time that there was a poorly placed sex scene was when we watched The Brain. Oh, like three but it's years so ago. much better in The Brain. <laughs> so that's. I think that that's a, a Stephen King trope, though. Because in like Christine, the guy – not the movie the book because i haven't watched the movie in a long time but in the book like the guy can't walk and so they have magic sex and then he can like continue to fight the evil car it it, it happens all the time in stephen king books i I mean trash can man gives hand jobs to every dude in the post-apocalypse in the stand whoa somebody just got a got a a booty call from uh trash can man apparently (laughs) sorry about that (laughs) no leave it in (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so I mean, I've I've I know Scott said he hasn't really tackled most of his notes, but I I mean, I got through all mine right now. How <laughs> anyone else have some additional stuff? Oh man, so we're not even talking about the okay, the pacing of this movie really blows. But that's yeah. and that that makes a lot more sense that it was not a finished movie. But the one scene that I like, uh, so so Mike Matt makes these super cuts for his Halloween parties, and I'm requesting that Matt do a super cut edition where the maniac that falls in the puddle like a fucking goober, and then it's like <laughs> oh, and it's and its hand melts, and it looks oh, like Spike so Mountain at the end of Gremlins. That's that's so. It's it's surprisingly competent. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of mo- that. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of moments where you're like, "Wow, that was hilarious and actually really well done." What happened there? So that's like it makes sense that there was a lot of this thing got passed around like a hot potato and then dropped. Yeah, it's like whoever did that scene. Why did they get fired from the set? <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. because they couldn't pay him. But th- this movie is great that it has one of my other favorite tropes. If we're talking tropes, um, the male lead did spend an afternoon studying uh, at the Institute for Fighting Inanimate Objects because <laughs> my friend fights that disembodied arm on the, the, the bus. And uh, then there's another body melt. Oh, oh, when um, Paula, the the 30-year-old Goonie, uh, she, she has like a super soaker and the knife-wielding maniac gets turned into goop in her bathroom. Like, she's so lucky that she has just a bathtub right there. Because, like, cleaning <laughs> that up otherwise would have been disgusting. That would have been really gross. I mean, but any, any kind of goo interactions are normally fairly <laughs> gross. Like, you know, plan out that bathtub placement before the attack. <laughs> well, I, okay. So what I'm not understanding here is that um, they were under the assumption. Well, so they figured out that the maniacs are susceptible to water. So they're, First of all, why is the school continuing with the Battle of the Bands, even though there are six missing kids and no one cares? It, it's just a, it's a rhetorical question. We don't get an answer. So Paula knows that they're that they're going to come after them. She's got a water gun. She's standing right next to a fire hose. But then uh, Natalie is like shocked and she's like trying to get the lead singer's attention. She's like, hey, hey, they found us. But like, they, why doesn't he have like a super soaker behind his guitar or something like that would have made so much more sense that they armed the entire school at the Battle of the Bands. And it's well, and I thought that that was the implication. That, that like, should have been the implication, have, right? <laughs> like they, no, they did that right before it. And then it just doesn't happen because I guess they filmed the scene where they implied that that's what they were going to do a year before they and then shot the battle no. sequence. No, they, 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 and look, this movie's got a lot of faults, but they were consistent with that one because when everyone is running out of the gymnasium, he's screaming at the mic to use the guns. But uh, it, but it still doesn't make sense because he's singing his third ballad of the night against a, <laughs> uh, like a glam rock band. And uh, also... Yeah. I've played a lot of Battle of the Bands in my time as a musician, and I have never, ever heard of one where there are two bands. It's not a battle if it's two bands. Yeah, that's a bicker. That's a bicker of the bands. <laughs> it's a spirited conversation. <laughs> and, like, and, and, and you can't just be a ballad band. You can't have every rose has a thorn without nothing but a good time. You can't just play straight ballads and call yourself a band. I mean, not in 1986, you can't. No, no. Yeah, now you can, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Imagine Dragons has been writing the same God fucking damn, song I for seven years. I knew that you were going to make an Imagine Dragons <laughs> joke. How? Unless there's anything else that you guys want to talk about, I want to talk to Mike a little bit about how did Five Second Films become a thing and, and Dude Bro Party Massacre a little bit. Yeah, and then we got to uh, talk about your new film, too. Yeah, for sure. I, I can I can do all of the things. Um, <laughs> five, five Second Films was created uh, way back in the early days of the interwebs of uh, 2008 uh, by Brian Ferenzi um, at USC. And uh, he, they launched the site like soon after he graduated uh, USC. I think it started with he did a 
um, a short, a film festival competition at USC where it was a, I think it was like a, some sort of short film. It was like an under 30 second type of thing. And so he just had the idea of like, Oh, what if I can do a film in five seconds? And uh, I think he ended up winning that short film competition. And so that idea, he then took over to Michael Rusle and a few other guys and they're like, Hey, let's, let's do this. And they launched the site. Um, they did the site. I think it launched in Halloween of 2008 and um, I moved out to LA. I'm from Indiana, Indianapolis originally. And I moved out after I graduated uh, from college here in Indiana in 2008. And I moved out. I was just doing stand up and sketch comedy. I was doing sketch comedy with a group called Brevity TV and um, was uh, performing at UCB, the Upright Citizens Brigade. And then we had similar friends and they were like, hey, have you ever heard of Five Second Films? And I was just like, fuck yeah, I have. <laughs> and and they're like, well, you should come hang out. Like, we're going to go over to their place and uh, hang out while they film. And I like showed up with like a case of beer and just started like moving C stands and stuff. So this would have been spring of 2010 when I first like went over to the house. And, uh, I seriously, it was like the greatest day of my life. I was just like, I was, you know, I, fe I felt like I had found the Ark of the Covenant or something. I, it was, but you didn't get melted. No, I, I didn't, I didn't get melted. I, I kind of, uh, well, it did kind of melt my face. Actually. I was, <laughs> I, I was obsessed. I was like, you guys are my new best friends and this is happening. And they're like, Ugh. Clinger. <laughs> yeah. no, I felt the thing is, I, I, I just kind of kept go. I was not invited back the next <laughs> uh, at all. It was just the thing is, like, I know where you live now. <laughs> you fucked up. <laughs> yeah. And I literally just kind of said, I'm just going to keep showing up with beer and just see what happens. And like, no one noticed. They were just like, <laughs> we can oh, like man. beer without liking you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm also six five. It's like I stick out, kind of. <laughs> but uh, I just kept going back week after week and like moving shit around and bringing beer. And they're such an insane group. They're just like, so I guess that guy is here now. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I think like I moved into the house and. I think 2011, so it's like a couple of years, 2012, I think, somewhere around there. Um, and we started writing Dude Bro, I think, somewhere like maybe summer of 2012, I think, June, June, July, something like that. And that was just the most insane experience of my life, writing it. <laughs> <laughs> and like um, how we did it. Well, first it was like deciding on like, all right, so we're going to make a movie, but like, what the fuck do we do? Of like, <laughs> one of like we've got a dozen people and everything is insane. Uh, like, you know, are we just, there was like a going thing where it's just like, we need to just put four people in a room, make it low budget, simple, an independent film that we can execute. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> you know really so it's like well what would we do and what we would do is essentially every single rule that there is for making your first film and we broke all of it but like <laughs> everything i'm just like so many locations so many things and really kind of it was a frankenstein script where we kind of wrote the outline together where it's just like oh this happens and then this happens and then this happens and then would divvy up the scenes amongst each other and we would go write them in pairs or by ourselves. And then we would come back as a group and patch all the scenes together. So it was essentially kind of like a bunch of sketches or like kind of the, the idea in a lot of ways was like, it's a whole bunch of independent sketches that are then stitched together to form like a whole movie. And that was made it just fucking insane. The first few, <laughs> the first few drafts, I mean, I'd actually, we had thought of for a while just releasing uh, the first early drafts of Dude Bro because it's so fucking hilarious because we'd have, <laughs> we'd have characters walking into a room and then the next scene, that same character would walk into the room again. 
<laughs> and like just because we like have written together so much and like know each other's heads like so intimately we would like write of like i'm gonna set alec up for a joke i know alec is writing the next scene so i'm gonna tee one up and then sooner or not it like would end up like paying off without us actually talking to each other so there's a lot of like setup and callbacks and like really random stuff that stayed I'm trying to think of like um the uh um the Sam Z, uh, the breaking of the space time continuum. That was an early, <laughs> that was an early draft joke. There's a lot of jokes in there that I mean that we were like, this serves no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> like, it just it hurts too bad to let it go, and I'm always gonna miss it. So <laughs> you know, we, it's gotta stay. Uh, so yeah, writing that script was pretty insane and. Alec Owen just did an incredible job of finally like reining it in and of like buttoning it up and making it make somewhat sense. Um, and then we shot it in uh, 2000, end of 2012, 2013 um, up at Big Bear in California. And then also out, like outside of Los Angeles and then also at our house, like a lot of it, I would say probably almost like 40 percent of the movie was just filmed at our house and like in our backyard and is that um, where you guys did you guys crush so many fucking beers like for real yeah yes and no <laughs> i mean we I, we were like you know at least me i was pretty nervous about that was like the first time i was acting in a movie you know and oh, like yeah. you know, being in the scenes like when we were making 5ss we're you know, we're fucking crushing beers and wasted, but <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It's only five seconds long. So as long as you get the camera pointed in the right fucking direction, you can, <laughs> it's like you can really get it out and do it. But it's like all of a sudden when there's like a big crew and like real lights and there's like people running around with walkie talkies, it's like, oh man, this is real grown up. I kind of feel like we should we should go smoke, you know, somewhere else. It's almost like <laughs> well, I, I guess I don't even mean drink the beers, but like, were those real beers? Like at the beginning when there's the slow-mo of you guys by the pool, you're just like flipping beer everywhere. That was, was that real beer? It was Sprite. <laughs> yeah. A lot of it was Sprite. Yeah. Uh, I forget exactly. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that they were just labels put on Sprite cans. Uh, none, of, none of the beers were actual real beers because we had uh, pretty much already figured out how, like, basically smelly and sticky that was going to oh, yeah. get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was – there There was a concerned effort not to – to use water as often as possible because our house would just get so fucking sticky. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was really you don't want to and then for my my latest project i can talk about with the soda cans i also dealt with large amounts of soda so it's like i've, I've learned so much from dude bro in my last short about having to have high volumes of cans this prop <laughs> you motherfuckers <laughs> better have recycled yeah. Oh no! Absolutely. Oh, thank Absolutely. goodness I was about to disavow five second films. <laughs> yeah. Oh had. well. I mean, you gotta know five second films. We go through a lot of aluminum. <laughs> you gotta get that five cents back. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of cans. In fact, there was a guy. Um, there was a homeless guy on our street in in Maltman that knew when it was time to like take the recycling out. And if we were being lazy, if we hadn't, he would bang the trash can <laughs> on the sidewalk and be like, hey! Hey! And be like, oh, it's, you got to take the cans out. I'm like, oh, okay. And then they come out there like, hey, sorry, man. Oh, <laughs> like because there was just such a high volume of beer cans going out the door that it was like our house was prime hobo territory. <laughs> um, so what's the new, what's the focus of the new short? Um, so the short I did and I had uh, 
fil- filmed it in 2017 and last year had its film festival circuit. It's called Smiley's and it's about a college student that becomes obsessed with a soda machine in the middle of nowhere. And uh, he kind of basically drinks too much of the soda and goes completely crazy and like loses his mind and a bunch of like, spooky stuff happens. That sounds like a Pete and Pete episode. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, so based off of a true story of like when I was in college where we would go to smoke weed was just drive around because I'm from rural Indiana. And uh, so there was a pot machine that was almost an exact amount of distance it took to smoke one joint. And at the end of that joint, there was just a 25 cent pot luck pot machine at the end of the road. And you put 25 cents in and you got a random soda. <laughs> and so the, the game was you would like go up to the machine and you'd yell out, give me root beer. And then you put your coin in and then you hit it and it'd be like, ah, fucking diet coke. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the game you played. And so I did a short based off of that. Um, and I am going to be releasing it soon. In fact, I would have, by the time this comes out, you guys should have a link, um, to be able to have it, see it publicly. Awesome. Awesome. Very excited. Ah, the smell of the video store. I love this place. Do you remember when you could just look at the walls of covers? We had to choose just by looking at the cover and reading the crappy synopsis. It was, you were leaving with one. And the only way to know what new movies were coming out is you actually had to watch the trailers instead of skipping them. Right, we didn't have the internet to look it up. We had one guy named Todd behind the counter that would (laughs) tell us what was good or not. And Todd strangely liked way too many romantic comedies. Yes, but you always knew when the boobies were coming because Todd made sure. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and remember all the awful CG we had to put up with in the mid-90s? We talk about that a lot, don't we? Join us on Analog Jones and the Temple Film where we talk about VHS tapes. And we wax nostalgia like none other. Now it's the last part of our show. What did you guys watch as a what would you guys watch as a double feature with Neon Maniacs? Uh Scott, you pick this one. How about you go first? Oh god, I don't even know. Um I'm this is a weird one because uh, quick little preface to my pick here i this was my first time watching neon maniacs as i think i may have mentioned earlier there was when i was very young i saw a trailer for a film where it looked like these punks were eating their fingers made out of cheese it was like really it really freaked me the fuck out um i asked around on reddit i want to say right when I joined Reddit like a decade ago and people were like, that's repo man. And I'm like, I don't think it's repo man. And um, I, I mean, cause I've seen repo man and I, I rewatched repo man, you know, maybe a decade ago and I didn't find it in there. And I was like, ah, maybe it's neon maniacs because you know, I just assumed from the cover it's not, but because of that, these two are inexplicably joined in my, uh, in my brain, so I would start with Neon Maniac. No, I would start with Repo Man because it's an actually good bonkers film, and then do Neon Maniacs to wind down, possibly fall asleep. All right, so for me, I'm gonna take the Battle of the Bands and a bunch of crazy people showing up in the high school gym. I'm gonna go with Idle Hands as my double Ooh, feature with Neon Maniacs. Nice. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. All, right. All right, Brian, what do you got? So the woman who played Natalie, she was in a movie called The Harvest with George Clooney, who is in Out of Sight with Michael Keaton, who was in Beetlejuice. <laughs> so there's and your six that, degrees of Beetlejuice. That's my six degrees of Beetlejuice. <laughs> Just a couple would, more, buddy. I, You're getting so close. I know. I'd pair this with Chud, too. <laughs> oh, above the Chud. All right. Starring Beef from Phantom of the Paradise. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike, I don't remember if I told you that we do this, but it, just in case, what's your double feature? Uh, yeah, I was just racking my brain. It's a little bit of a combo. It is kind of, uh, it really reminded me of Phantom of Paradise. Phantom of Paradise. 
Oh, so good. Uh, the music of movie that I really love, but the whole they, there wasn't enough mutant stuff really. There could have been a little more body horror, but it was kind of street trash ish. Oh yeah, <laughs> it does have that street horror. trash kind of feel to it. Yeah, a little bit. So I don't either one of those two. I feel would work well with it. Well, that was Neon Maniacs from 1986. If you hit up the Facebook page, I'm sure we will have a link to Mike's newest short smileys up there for you to check out. We will be back. Uh, well, actually, Monster Mania is right around the corner, motherfucker. So get ready for that. That's that's the big thing. Get prepared for us to be at Mania. It's going to be a great time. We cannot wait. Um, and... I am trying to remember what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, tune in next week when we're going to do something a little bit different. We're gonna we're gonna go down under. Yeah, yes, we Let's are. See what happened? We're gonna go down there, see some marsupials. Gonna have a good time. It's gonna be life changing. Uh, so tune in next week to find out what's going on there. And in the meantime, hit up us on all the social media. Visit our website at hmmpodcast.com. Go ahead and rate and review us on iTunes and all of the other ways that you listen to the show. And hit up our Patreon account at patreon.com backslash hmnpodcast. And if you go over there right now, you will find a bonus episode of me, Brian, Scott, and Mike just talking about some of the VHS covers that we remember from our childhood but never really got around to renting until we were adults. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening, guys. You're listening to the Geekscape Network. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.